This is Teresa Matsura, and you're listening to Uncanny Japan. It's Halloween. Do you want to hear a scary Japanese legend? And my new bright idea? Keep listening. Would you like to explore the stranger, more obscure corners of Japanese culture? Dig a little deeper into superstitions, curious customs, and all those mysterious creatures that inhabit the land? If so, then this is the podcast for you. Uncanny Japan is where I, author Teresa Matsura, share all the fascinating tidbits I unearth while doing research for my writing. From the bizarre to the ghastly and everything in between. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, hey, how are you? Are you okay? Are any of us okay? Today I'm going to tell you a tale of a woman who was very much not okay, but then she took matters into her own hands and kind of was okay. Then not okay again. Believe me, it's more interesting than that. But first, let me mention briefly my bright idea. I get a lot of messages and emails. And I love it. Thank you so much. And I apologize if I can't write back right away. But through the years, I've identified two issues, and I think I've come up with a solution. First, there are listeners who would like to support me or my writing or the show, but they don't like or aren't interested in or are unable to do the subscription model, which is Patreon. And that's cool. Totally understandable. There's the Kofi and buy me a coffee option. Again, thank you everyone who's helped me there. But I want to give something back in return, and I haven't quite figured out how to do that on either of those platforms. So the second thing is I hear from quite a few people who love these old folk tales, lore, legends, and myth, and they'd like to hear more. Again, perhaps they aren't into Patreon and instead would like to pick and choose which stories they listen to. Maybe they don't like the especially horror-tinged ones. Or maybe they do like them, and only them. So somewhere along the way, I imagined a Venn diagram of those two groups, and where they intersect is my bright idea. I'm going to start putting my translated, retold, and often reimagined folktales up as audio shorts. If that sounds familiar, yes. It's very similar to what I do monthly on Patreon. But over there, I like to experiment a little, read some other in-the-public-domain pieces, essays, Lafcadio Hearn, or maybe read my own serialized Asahi newspaper story. With these new audio shorts, though, there will be a format. The folktale or legend, and then at the end, a short commentary where I talk about my thoughts and any interesting research I found along the way. And of course, $5 and up patrons will be getting these too as regular content when I get them done. Another plus is that I found an audiobook distributor that isn't a monster, like the A word. And when you buy any of their audiobooks, you get to choose a local or indie bookstore, and they'll split the profits with them. So instead of buying Bezos more houses, penthouses, jets, yachts, or rocket ship companies, we can put money back into our communities. I'll tell you more in a minute about how to get the first story, which is my retelling of Kuazu Nyobo, The Wife Who Didn't Eat. But first, let's get to today's show. Cue creepy, slightly Trent Reznor-esque music by my son Julian. Now, if you're home alone at night, light a couple candles and close your eyes. Today's chill bump inducing legend is my retelling of the classic Uji no Hashihime. The Bridge Maiden of Uji. I'm going to do this one in the same format as the audio shorts. So you can get an idea if it's something you're interested in or not. So after the story, I'll add some commentary, research notes, and thoughts. But first, the story of Hashihime has been told for over a thousand years, 
And one thing I've noticed in every version I've ever read or heard is that the focus is always on the action our protagonist takes. And yes, she's the protagonist in my eyes. We love the horrible part that comes later. Sadly, there's only a single line or two about why she does what she does, what drives her to this unthinkable deed. Little to nothing is known about the young woman herself and who she is, which really is the story. So let me start with a couple things that I imagine to be true for this legend to make sense, be more potent, and to have endured for so long. Mukashi, Mukashi. Let's start with a young woman who has fallen in love. She may be rich or poor or somewhere in between. But what is true is that she has given her heart to a man and believes this is a love that will last forever. She's not cynical or suspicious, and she's never been hurt by anyone before. She believes in the goodness of people, and if we dislike her for this, maybe it says more about us than about her. What is important to note, though, is that what our young maiden does later isn't because she was evil or malicious at heart. It's the opposite. It's because she was good and hopeful and innocent, and then she was betrayed. Our maiden falls in love and gets married, and I'm guessing she moves away from her family and friends, everything and everyone she's ever known. Maybe it's her husband's job that takes them to Kyoto. But now she's alone in this big, beautiful, magical city, except for her dear husband who is working hard at whatever job he does. From here, everything should be happily ever after. Our maiden is keeping the house and probably readying it for the family she hopes to raise soon. Meanwhile, her husband is coming in late every night, exhausted. She feels for him, wishes his work wasn't so difficult. She supports him in any way she can. This goes on for a long time, until one fateful day she discovers her husband is having an affair and has been lying to her this whole time. All that love and affection she had received when they first met is being lavished on another. There are probably more details that make her situation even more unbearable. Maybe she was unable to have the child she so desperately wanted, and yet learns this mistress is pregnant with her husband's baby. Is he cruel to her? Does he tease her? Nowadays, we might leave these circumstances, find help, but it wasn't so easy back then. Perhaps she is unable to return home to her family for whatever reason. Distance, money, shame. And so she is left entirely alone, brokenhearted, deceived, and she must live every day in that house knowing what she knows with no support at all. Maybe he comes home sometimes, maybe he doesn't. She broods, sadness growing into bitterness, helplessness growing into rage, hate. Our maiden at this point goes a little bit mad, under the circumstances understandable, Somehow she learns about the Kifune Jinja, or Kibune Shrine, in northern Kyoto, where an extremely powerful water goddess called Takaokami is enshrined. Our maiden walks for hours through the city and up the steep slopes of Mount Kurama to the shrine. It's dark when she arrives. Still, she prays fervently for help, an answer, revenge. When she is done, she turns and walks all through the night back home. 
he isn't there. The next day, she wakes, dresses, and with blisters on her feet, legs sore, she makes the long trek and returns to Kifune Shrine again. She repeats her prayer, her pleading, this time with an emphasis on the request for revenge. The following day, day three, she goes again, physically weaker, but her mind is sharper and more focused. As she walks through the city, she looks around and understands there is no place or person she can turn to for help. No one. She imagines herself as a swift flowing river, like the Kurama River which she walks along for some way. Finally, she reaches the bridge to cross over it and stops in the middle, waning moon overhead the leaves just starting to turn in early autumn. She gathers her strength and goes across and climbs the footpath and then the steps that lead to the shrine. Again she prays. She returns the next day, day four, day five, day six. Meanwhile, the goddess Takaokami is really feeling the girl's pain and admiring her determination. She's sympathizing with the maiden. She understands this hate and this need for revenge. The goddess doesn't like to encourage such things, being a goddess and all, but she does have the power to make it happen. Then the young woman gets more specific in her prayers. She implores Takaokami, Please, I am so weak. There is nothing I can do. But if I am turned into a living oni, I can exact revenge on this horrible man who continues to torment me. The goddess gets an idea. On the night before the seventh visit, up the mossy stone steps of Kifune Jinja, in a back tatami room lit by a single oil lamp, a certain Shinto priest wakes suddenly from the most disturbing dream he's ever had. In it, the water goddess, Tako Kami, has come to him and orders him to pass a message to a mysterious woman who will be making a visit to the shrine soon, even though it is late. Not wanting to incur any divine wrath, the priest dresses and hurries down to the gate to meet the woman. What the goddess has told him to do, he does not want to do. It deeply disturbs him. But he is just a man, and he cannot, he will not disagree with the goddess who chose him and who is believed to be a great dragon who controls all water, rain, and snow. As soon as he reaches the gate, he sees a beautiful young woman approaching from the other direction. It's exactly as the goddess predicted. He bows and greets her and says, Tonight in my dreams, Tako Okami came and commanded me to pass along her message to you. The goddess says your prayers have been heard and you'll be allowed to become a living oni demon in order to get revenge on your miserable husband. You no longer need to come here anymore. Instead, return home and sew yourself a red kimono. After it is finished, rub vermilion paste all over your face and neck and body, keeping in your chest the rage you feel, the all-encompassing need for retribution. Once your skin is dyed the deep crimson of an oni, Put on the kimono and tie your hair up into five horns. Then, take an iron trivet and turn it upside down. Place it on your head so that it rests there like a heavy metal crown. Upon the three legs of the stand, tie small pine torches and light them. Finally, take two more lit torches and clench them in your teeth so that they hang from either side of your mouth. In this manner, imagine you are a great oni. You may then leave the house 
and walk to the Uji River. Once there, immerse yourself in its water. Feel your heart change, your body change. Feel yourself become more powerful, feared by all people. Perform this ritual for 21 nights. On the last day, your transformation will be complete and you may visit your husband and do as you wish. With that, the priest bows again to the woman and flees back to his room. The young maiden does exactly as she is told. Every day for 21 days, she uses cinnabar to paint her skin and dons her red kimono. She ties up her hair, places and lights the iron crown. Slowly, she makes her way through the streets. Two burning twists of pine held tight in her wicked teeth. She strikes terror in the heart of everyone who sees her. Screams, gasps, people running away, locking their doors. But she doesn't care. She feels herself growing stronger. She is changing. On the 21st night, she emerges from the Uji River as Hashihime. Meanwhile, the whole time this is going on, the young woman's husband is also having nightmares. Nightmares that are growing worse as the days go by, as the maiden grows farther from her innocent self and closer to the demon she is meant to be. Finally, he can't take it any longer, and calls upon the famous Omyoji, Abe no Seime, the most powerful mystic in all of Japan. Abe no Seime recognizes these dreams. He explains what is happening to the husband and says there is nothing he can do to help. The wife's single-minded purpose to punish him and do him harm Coupled with her getting the gods' attention, sympathy, and help is a mighty thing. Also, Seimei mentions that tonight just happens to be the night his newly turned Oni wife is planning to come and murder both him and his lover in their sleep. But the husband begs and begs until Abe no Seimei finally agrees to do what he can. Two straw dolls are put together and dressed and placed inside the futons of the couple. Seime prays long and hard to any deity that will listen. Finally, night comes and everyone hides. Hashihime sweeps into the house like a storm, kimono blowing about her, hair wild, her skin burnished red, black eyes shining, reflecting the firelight from the torches she carries in her hair. She holds a large club in one hand. Seimei's magic briefly covers the straw dolls from her sight. She doesn't notice it's not them. Hashihime kneels beside what she thinks is her sleeping husband. She whispers, when we were married, I believed it would be for a thousand years. But instead, you've dashed my heart for no reason other than your own selfishness. Having been dismissed by you, my sorrow overwhelms me, while I still cry tears of love, mocking you, missing you, blaming you. Each day and night, wakeful or sleeping, suffering without end, Revenge, revenge for the fallen, revenge for the forgotten, revenge for all those cast aside. These thoughts whirl like black leaves tossed by gales in the demon's mind. I must take your life, and the gods forgive me, you pitiable man. Hashihime then strikes hard with her club the effigies of her husband and his lover. Again and again she strikes, but soon she notices the trick. At that moment, Seimei's magic takes over, and rising and swirling around the mad and broken Oni, commands her to leave the house. Hashihime screams out. Abeno Seimei confronts her, and the maiden of the bridge calms and chuckles to herself. 
she sees her husband and his lover cowering and peeking from behind a folding screen in the corner of the room. She realizes that tonight she will not be allowed the revenge she was promised. She deserves. She speaks. You must understand. My resentment will never end. Then catching her husband's eye, somewhere, somehow, we will meet again. And then in an instant, her presence softens. Her body turns to mist. And she disappears. The End I always say this, but I'm going to say it again. There are many different versions and interpretations of Hashihime of Uji. Some have her waiting by a bridge for a lover. Some have her husband killed in a battle, and she's expecting his return. In some, she's married, divorced. In others, the man in question is just her lover. This version is mine, but it follows quite closely the no play, the Iron Crown, Kanoa. There is even one little bit I borrowed from the play, and that is when Hashihime addresses her husband at the end. I thought her little speech was nice. You'll also note that the tale is called Hashihime of Uji. There are other Hashihimes out there, but I believe hers is the first. And speaking of first, remember episode 52, Putting a Curse on Your Enemies, Ushi no Kokumairi? Well, Hashihime is believed to be the impetus for that practice. Marching into a forest with candles in your hair and banging an effigy of your enemy into an old tree. Somewhere along the way, the Hashihime legends got entwined with the Hitobashira practice. Remember Hitobashira, episode 81? When people were sacrificed to the gods to make an embankment, a castle wall, a tunnel, or a bridge stronger. So sometimes you'll hear mention of a Hashihime, and it will be referring to a poor soul who was killed in order to strengthen or bless a bridge. So Hashi means bridge, something that joins one piece of land to another, connects here to there. In Japanese, it's called Genkaisen, or boundary line. This Genkaisen connects this world this reality we're living in, to the world on the other side, the place where spirits, both malicious and godly, dwell. Hashihime, her name literally means bridge princess, was able to make that connection, move from one to the other. Another thing about the different Hashihime tales is that in some, they are jealous demon spirits, while in others, they fiercely guard a certain bridge, perhaps from invaders. They are a kind of mamorigami, or protecting god. People prayed to their Hashihime, a guardian deity of Genkaisen, boundary lines. The outside enemies she protected you from could be real human-type bad guys or disease. Yet still, her legend is strong, and it's said that if you stand on a Hashihime bridge and you praise another bridge, or if you sing either of the songs, Aoi no Ue or Nomiya, which are about a woman's jealousy, then the most heinous of curses will befall you. People are so careful, even today, not to incur our demon slash guardian's wrath that if there is a wedding procession, it will not cross a Hashihime's bridge or pass by one of her shrines. You don't want her to see a beautiful bride or a happy couple and be reminded of what happened, oh, a thousand years ago, and fall into a jealous rage. Speaking of Hashihime shrines, I visited the Uji no Hashihime shrine last time I went to Kyoto, and it was so tiny a little sad. It's literally in someone's backyard. We weren't sure we could go in or not. It's sandwiched between two houses. I wanted to buy a couple Hashihime buttons, but there was no one home, and it kind of looked like no one had been home for quite some time. 
I hope everything's okay there. Okay, lastly, another interesting language thing is that the word hashi was a variation of airashi, which means pretty or adorable or charming. So hashihime could very well just mean charming princess. Some believe that's the original meaning. Anyway, hashihime can be found mentioned in literature all through the ages. But the earliest it looks like is in 905 as a poem in a book called Kokin Wakashu. The author is unknown, but it goes something like this. Upon a narrow grass mat, laying down her robe only, tonight, again, she must be waiting for me, Hashihime of Uji. Which isn't scary at all if you think of Hashihime just meaning charming princess a lovely woman taking off her jacket and waiting for her lover. Okay, I'll end there. I'm literally recording this episode as I'm also trying to finish up the cover art and the editing of the first audio short story. I haven't even handed it over to Richard yet. He has to add my art piece to his cool cover design, and then of course final edits, and then anything the audiobook people require. So I'm quite worried there'll be some kind of hiccup and it won't be out when you hear this. So a heads up there. If you'd like, though, check out Libro.fm, L-I-B-R-O dot F-M, and search for Teresa Matsura and see if The Wife Who Didn't Eat is up yet. It'll be in a similar format as today's tale. Lastly, and very importantly, and I keep forgetting, is Richard has been busting his butt putting up the subtitles on YouTube not automatically generated ones that can be wrong quite a lot of the time, but he makes sure that they're correct, even the Japanese. So look at those if you'd like. He's working his way through, and it seems like he has a whole bunch already done. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Happy Halloween, and I'll talk to you again real soon. You've reached the end of the show. And I just want you to know how much we appreciate you listening and supporting us. Any subscribing, reviewing, and gushing to your friends, family, even random strangers, really does help keep us going. If you have the means and you want to help a little more and get a little more, we are making extra content over on Patreon. All for only $5 a month. Or, if you like to read horror, you might be interested in my Bram Stoker-nominated short story collection, The Carp-Faced Boy and Other Tales. Hontoni arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you again, and I'll talk to you real soon.